I started protesting when I was five years old, but even at that first picket, there was a sign that said, gays are worthy of death. So God hates fags is what Westboro's message that we became known for. We were the good guys, and everyone outside the church was evil and going to hell, and we had the only message that would bring the world any hope. We had to go and warn people These terrible things are happening, and if you want this pain to stop, then you have to change because God isn't going to change. After the September 11 attacks, we had the sign that said, thank God for September 11. What were we thinking? This massive crowd comes down. We were at this corner of this intersection of these three streets. By the time they actually reached us, we're just enraged. There was no space between us and them. It got really dicey. One of my cousins gave his signs to somebody else and like started standing on top of a trash can, pretending like he wasn't with us. They were, again, incredibly intense because obviously the circumstances are so sobering. It brings me incredible sadness to think about now. I can't do this forever. My family, I, they would refuse to have any contact with me at all once I left. Somebody that we had confided in sent a letter to my parents and told them that we were planning to leave. And then that email came in and and we left. Alice, as you know, James Renner is one of my favorite true crime authors, and he has a new book out, Little Crazy Children. For readers of Ann Rule and Greg Olson, it is a riveting new true crime book from the acclaimed author of True Crime Addict, and the creator host of the podcast, True Crime, This Week, and the Philosophy of Crime. James explores the unsolved murder of 16-year-old Lisa Pruitt in the real-life town of the best-selling novel Little Fires Everywhere for a painstakingly researched account of a senseless and heartbreaking tragedy and the people who were pulled into its aftermath. In September of 1990, in the Cleveland suburb of Shaker Heights, 16-year-old Lisa Pruitt, a poetry lover and member of a church youth group, was on her way to a midnight tryst with her boyfriend when she was viciously stabbed to death, only 30 feet from the boy's home. The murder cast a palpable gloom over the upscale community and sparked accusations, theories, and rumors among Lisa's friends and peers. Together, they wove a damning narrative that circled back to a likely suspect, weird high school outcast Kevin Young. Without a shred of evidence, the teen was arrested, charged, and tried for the crime. His eventual acquittal didn't squelch the anger and outrage among those who believe that Kevin got away with murder. With a fresh perspective and painstaking research culled from police files, court records, transcripts, uncollected evidence, and new interviews, James Renner reconstructs the events leading up to and following that heartbreaking night. What emerges is a portrait of a community seething with dark undercurrents. Its single-minded authorities, protective, status-conscious parents, and the deeply peer-pressured teens within Lisa's circle. Who had the capacity for such unchecked violence? What monsters still lurk in the dark? After more than 30 years, questions like these continue to fester among the community of Shaker Heights, Ohio, still deeply scarred by wounds that remain hidden, unspoken, and unhealed. So make sure you pick up Little Crazy Children at your favorite bookseller. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our discussion of January 13th. everybody and welcome to this episode of the prosecutors i'm brett and i'm joined as always by my motherly co-host alice <laughs> it's like not a compliment it's at totally all, a compliment thanks. what are you talking about you're like mother of the year alice and everybody thinks so i'm definitely not mother of the year but thanks and that's because you guys are hearing us the next day but really we've been recording for over an hour and i ran out to check on my baby 
still there, in case you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Has not learned the ability to walk yet. Yeah, still there, but we're gonna we're gonna try and be, you know, relentless in our conciseness <laughs> and see if we can you know knock what we've out never this, been this i just want to say i just want to say y'all we're not even halfway through what we meant to talk about on sure. this day and at the beginning of yesterday's episode brett was like we'll finish it in one episode and i'm like do you do you know us have you met us <laughs> yeah concise we are not i would like to think we're thorough i think it's thorough we really we, dig into the cases but okay that's one way to th- let's go <laughs> let's go let's go we left you last time it was 3 30 in the afternoon on january 13th the day that hey Min lee disappeared and unfortunately by this time her cousin's school is calling and telling her family hey never showed up to pick up her cousin and this was completely unlike her and the fact that it was unlike her led a lot of people to think something terrible's happened and in fact i think now we can all say for certain that by this point she had either been taken by the person who was going to do something terrible to her, or she had been murdered by this point. Around 3.30, while this call is happening to Hay's family, Jen will testify at trial that it was around this time that Jay left from her apartment where he had been up to this point, playing video games with her brother, to go somewhere she wasn't she wasn't entirely sure where. It's likely, based on what we know from the cell records, that Jay actually left at least 15 to 30 minutes earlier than this. And frankly, Jen being off by 15 to 30 minutes compared to pretty much everybody else in this case is pretty good. But her testimony is consistent with the cell phone records that we've seen up to this point. If you think that Jay was now picking up Adnan, who has committed a crime. The next call is a big one. The next call may be the most important call in the entire case. At 3.32, a call is made from Adnan's phone to Nisha Tana. Now, Nisha is Adnan's new girlfriend. Girlfriend might be strong. This is the girl that he met on New Year's Eve the girl who he spent a lot of time on the phone with. He's seen her one other time at a party. They've never gone on a date, but they've talked about going on dates, and they've talked a lot on the phone for hours at a time. And in fact, according to Adnan, she's one of the reasons he got his cell phone in the first place because he's been through this with Hay. He wants to be able to talk to her, and that's why he's gotten his cell phone. Well, on, at 3.32 on this day, this call is made from Adnan's phone to Nisha Tana. The call lasts for 2 minutes and 22 seconds. According to multiple people, while Adnan is on the phone with Nisha, he puts Jay on the phone. Nisha said this call happened a day or two after Adnan got his cell phone. She says that she remembers talking to Jay and that he doesn't seem all that friendly. Jay will tell police in his second interview that Adnan put him on the phone with some girl from Silver Spring. He didn't really know her, didn't know anything about her. He just knew she was from Silver Spring. Nisha was from Silver Spring. Ali, who is Adnan's brother, will tell his defense team that Nisha received a call from Adnan, quote, at 3.30 on the day of the incident. This call is a huge problem for Adnan. It puts Adnan and Jay together at exactly when they would need to be together for Adnan to have killed Hay. It contradicts Adnan's story about being at school waiting for track practice to start. And it confirms a critical part of Jay's story. For this reason, it is not surprising that there has been a lot of discussion about this call and a lot of effort to explain it away. There is one inconsistency built into what Nisha Tana says to the police. She will tell them at some point that she thought Adnan and Jay were heading to the video store where Jay worked when this call occurred. But Jay had not started his job at the video store yet. So that's led some people to think that this call with Jay happened later and Nisha is misremembering. The problem with that theory, of course, is we aren't trying to figure out whether or not a call happened on this day and whether or not it happened at this time. It did happen, and it happened at that time. And there's no question. 
And it happened at the time that Nisha said it did. And it lasted for two minutes and 22 seconds. Jay didn't know Nisha at all. Only Adnan did. So why would Jay call Nisha if Jay was alone? Maybe it was a butt dial. This is the theory that has been proposed by Adnan's defenders. Charitably, that is a stretch. This is a call that lasted over two minutes. Nisha didn't have voicemail, which means she either spent over two minutes trying to get the person's attention when they called her, or the call was never answered but billed anyway through some quirk at the cell phone company at the time where they're charging you when the phone's ringing and ringing but never answered. If this is a butt dial, all of this happened at the perfect time to incriminate Adnan, a call that could only have been made to someone he knew. And when it just so happens to coincide with what Nisha remembers about the call, including the fact that Adnan put Jay on the phone. I mean, the simplest answer here is the best. Adnan and Jay called Nisha that day. There's really no reason to believe the alternative other than the fact that if that's true, it is really bad for Adnan. Now, whatever the case, this call pings the same tower as earlier, Woodlawn Tower C, which covers the Best Buy area. So basically, to sum up what Brett just said, that's a perfect example of Occam's razor. The best and most reasonable answer for that 332 call is that it was Adnan who made the call. And Jay didn't know Nisha, and Nisha didn't know Jay, but they each remembered something about the other, not by name, but by description, that describes the other person. And look, if you're wondering to yourself, why in the world would Adnan call Nisha and put Jay on the phone? He's making an alibi. Remember, what ends up happening is Jay is going to tell the police exactly what Adnan supposedly did. Jay is going to roll on Adnan. If Jay never rolls on Adnan, it actually works out for Adnan that he's with Jay. He's got a perfect alibi. He's with his buddy Jay. And I can confirm it. We both talked to my girlfriend. I wasn't killing anybody. What are you talking about? I was with my buddy, right? I mean, that's that's like a built-in story that he's established for himself. It's an alibi that he's created. Now, once Jay flips on him... Then it's a huge problem because then all of a sudden being with Jay is an issue. But if Jay had never broken, if Jay had stuck with Adnan, this is all assuming Adnan's guilty, but if he had stuck with Adnan, then this is a great thing for Adnan. It is the creation of an alibi at precisely the time when Hay would have been being killed. And note also, if Adnan is guilty. This is another indicator that he is incredibly close to Jay because any other person, you wouldn't even have to like roll on Adnan. You wouldn't have to like sell him out. You'd just be telling the truth because why would you know enough to basically stick with the alibi that Adnan is trying to create here if Adnan is creating an alibi? And so he clearly has a level of trust with Jay and is much closer to him to make him be part of his alibi and trust him enough to be part of his alibi, thinking that Jay is going to stick by him and not flip on Adnan. And here's the other thing about Jay. If Adnan did this, he's smart. Because Jay is the person the police are least likely to believe. His profile is, he graduated from high school, great. He's working at a porn store. The video store he's working at is a porn store. He's selling pot and other drugs. He's been in trouble with the police. Oh, by the way, he's a black man in Baltimore. This is the guy that you can trust him because... Who are they going to believe? Me? I'm the, the high school honor student, prom king. I'm on the track team. Sometimes I play football. I'm going to college. They're not going to believe you, right? So in, in so many ways, Jay, he's kind of perfect. I mean, Jay will later say that the reason he thinks Adnan trusts him is because he's the criminal element. He's like the guy. Like, if you're going to go to a criminal, it's him. I think there's some truth to that. But there's also this aspect of why would the police believe Jay if Jay's going to say that Adnan is the one who did this and not Jay himself. So moving forward in the timeline, at 348, there's a call to some guy named Phil that Jay knows, and it lasts a minute 25. The phone is now pinging the A tower, meaning that it's moving towards Woodlawn High School. And by the way, what we have here just kind of further confirms that Jay and Adnan are together because at 332, 
someone that only Adnan knows, Nisha, is being called. And then just really a few minutes later at 348, someone only Jay knows, Phil, is being called from the same cell phone. What's the most likely scenario there? They're both there to use the phone. In other words, they're together. At 3.59 p.m., one of them calls Patrick, a guy Jay knew that sold marijuana. Jay knew Patrick much better than Adnan, who, if he knew him, barely knew him at all. And it's likely that Jay is the one calling. The phone pings the Woodlawn Tower at this point as well, the A sector of the tower. Around 4 p.m., Jay says that he dropped Adnan back off at Woodlawn High School because that's when track practice begins. No one can say whether Adnan was there, though he probably was for all the reasons Brett said earlier, regardless of whether he had anything to do with Hay's murder. However, one of the coaches, Coach Sai, does remember talking to Adnan on a day near the end of Ramadan. And in fact, it was the longest and most in-depth conversation they'd ever had. That conversation likely was January 13th, this day, though it's also possible it was earlier in the month. What we can say for certain is that no one took attendance. The other coach, Gerald Russell, had no idea if Adnan was there and he'd keep any records. During Ramadan, the Muslim kids weren't really required to run anyway, and there were something like 40 kids on the track team. So Adnan, if they didn't take attendance that day, could easily have been missed. But likely he was there because he would have been there like brett said if he had nothing to do with hayes murder because that's where he would be on that day and if he did have something to do with hayes murder he was probably there too because it was going to be part of his alibi and jay says as much that he has to be back for the track practice to be seen and it also would make sense that he kind of go out of his way if this is part of his alibi to stand out among the 40 kids and the other muslim kids who may be coming and going by having a very in-depth memorable conversation with one of the coaches. And that's what I find so fascinating about this, because the number of people who point to this conversation is somehow proving that Adnan was at track practice that day. He absolutely was at track practice that day. He was there no matter what happened to Hay. And if he killed Hay, of course this would be the day he has the in-depth conversation with Coach Cy. According to Jay, he's told him, I need to be seen. I need people to see me at track practice. He knows he can get there a little late if he needs to, because it's Ramadan. He doesn't have to run anyway. Nobody's paying any attention to him. He's not that good a runner. He's not the star. I mean, look, I played basketball when I was in school. I was terrible at it, and I can tell you the coaches didn't care anything about me, whether I was there or not. They certainly weren't paying attention to me. They were paying attention to the people who were actually good at basketball, right? And, you know, Adnan was on the team, but he wasn't exactly breaking any records. And because it's Ramadan, he's not eating all day. For those of you who don't know, in Islam, during Ramadan, very holy time, you don't eat during the day, you break your fast at sunset. So he isn't eating, so he doesn't need to be running. It wouldn't be good for him to do so, and the track coaches are very cognizant of this, and they don't make the kids who are Muslim and who are fasting run. So they certainly wouldn't be paying that much attention. But Coach Sai remembers there was this one day in January, on a warm day, And there weren't that many warm days in January in Baltimore where he had the most in-depth conversation he'd ever had with Adnan. And they talked all about Ramadan. They talked all about this stuff. And people have pointed to this as, see, he was at track practice. He couldn't have killed Hay. To me, the more you prove that that conversation happened on January 13th, the worse for Adnan. Because it feels like what we've talked about before. It feels like creating an alibi. It's the unusual thing that you do on the day when you need people to see you somewhere else. It's just like we've talked about in the Murdaugh trial. All those phone calls Murdaugh's making on the way to his mom's house and on the way back. He's establishing an alibi. We talked about this in in some of our other cases where people are friendlier than they've ever been. They're talking to everybody they see, and it just so happens to be the day something terrible happens. Well, that's what you have here. And Adnan's a smart guy, too, because if he's developing an alibi through Coach Sai, Coach Sai is the right one to do it with because Coach Sai doesn't know Adnan that well. And so he's not going to be able to comment on whether this in-depth conversation or the way that Adnan was acting was out of the ordinary for Adnan. He's just going to remember this conversation because he never has a conversation of this depth with Adnan. But he also doesn't know him well enough to be able to comment on any of the things like he looked nervous that day. He looked like he's trying to create an alibi, that sort of thing. Thing. 
And of course, it stands out in his mind. If Coach Sai had a conversation with Adnan every day or a lot of days, he wouldn't remember this specific day. Adnan needs Coach Sai to remember this specific day. This is the day that matters. So at 403, Alonzo Sellers clocks out at Coppin State University where he works. The next ping from the cell phone is at 412. This ping is a good bit east of where it was before. Remember, the cell phone was over by the Best Buy, then it moves towards Woodlawn High School, which is about the time that Adnan would have started his track practice. It is now moved over to Jay's grandmother's house again. It is now pinging over Jay's grandmother's house, and this call is, in fact, to Jen Pusateri once again. At 427, we have an incoming call. We talked about this before. Incoming calls are a little bit more controversial. We're going to talk about it in depth later. But at 427, there's an incoming call to the cell phone that pings 824 Dorchester Road in Cantonsville, Maryland. This is the tower for Jen's house. So earlier, we had an outgoing call to Jen that was covering Jay's grandmother's house. Now we have an incoming call to the cell phone at 427 that is covering Jen's house. The C quadrant is pinged, which is just to the west of Jen's. It's possible that Jay is at her house at this time. He could also be at his house. So he was at his grandmother's house earlier, but he has a house down in this area as well. Or he could be at Jen's. And because her house is close to sort of this C quadrant, it sort of straddles a couple places. Either he's at her house or he's close to her house. In any event, he's close to Jen's house when this call happens. So that was 427. At 4.58 and 54 seconds, there's another incoming call that pings the same tower and quadrant as the last incoming call. And it seems like most people agree, whether there was a murder or not, that this is the call to Jay from Adnan to pick him up at track practice. Now, it's also possible that Jay had already picked up Adnan, and this is a call from another person, Stephanie. Stephanie, who's Jay's girlfriend, will tell police that on the day of the murder, which was her birthday... She called Adnan between 4 and 5.30, and she said that during that call, Adnan and and Jay were together. This is the only call that really fits that time period, if it happened, if she's thinking about the right day. It was her birthday, so you'd think she'd remember, but it's hard to say. As I said, most people think this is the come pick me up from track practice call. Now, there's a weird thing about Stephanie that I don't understand, but it's this kind of strategic, tactical decision that the prosecution made at some point. Despite the fact that Stephanie and Jay were dating, and Stephanie would say that Jay had told her that Adnan killed Hay, and that, in fact, Jay had told her that Adnan had threatened Stephanie if Jay didn't keep his mouth shut, Stephanie doesn't testify. The prosecution decides not to put her on the stand. Some of this might have been hearsay problems. Most of what Stephanie knows, she knows because she heard it from Jay. But Jay's credibility is going to be questioned. And as we've talked about before with hearsay, when someone's credibility is questioned, when they're accused of making up a story, you can use prior statements that are consistent with that story to bolster them. So you could imagine calling Stephanie as sort of a rebuttal witness to bolster Jay and say, hey, look, Jay told me this before anybody arrested him, before he was taken in. He told me all this stuff. Stephanie's never called to testify, so we don't have her testimony. All we have is what she told the police. And one thing to note about trial preparation, the prosecution may have planned on calling Stephanie. They may have even walked through what they would have. They may may have prepped her, but they may have decided last minute not to do that. It may be that Stephanie is incredibly Adnan friendly. They are best friends after all. And she may be shading what she wants to say. We've talked about this where because Even though there's no privilege that attaches between like a mother and a child, there's going to be like a level of loyalty that we as the prosecution try to stay away from calling someone's mother or someone's father because you're just not going to get the type of testimony out of them because they want to protect their child no matter what. It's just ingrained in them. Even if they're not lying, they're not going to give you the types of answers that you need to propel your story forward. So it may be that situation because we do know that Stephanie and Adnan are very close friends. But for whatever reason... She's kind of a big hole, I think, to have. And so in my mind, if the prosecution chose not to call her, it's because of one of these big reasons where they prepped her, talked to her, heard her answers, and knew that they were not going to be able to get answers that would help propel their story. At 5 o'clock, Officer Adcock responds to the Lee household where her brother explains that Hay was supposed to pick up her cousin after school but never showed up. Adcock first calls Asia, Asia Pittman, 
Pittman says that she saw Hay at the end of the school day around 2.15 p.m. Adcock then called Adnan at around 6.30, as we're going to see below with the cell phone pings. Adnan told Officer Adcock that he was supposed to get a ride home from Hay after school, but that he was running late. And he told the officer that he felt Hay probably left after waiting for him for a short while. Again, he doesn't know that, even if that's what happened, right? This is an example of people filling in stories. He's talking to the police here. He's telling him something that he couldn't know for a fact, that if Hay were waiting for her, him, that she would have left. One interesting thing to note, if what Adnan told Adcock is true, he had not called or paged Hay at any point after school to let her know that he was fine, that he was running late, to leave without him, to explain that he'd gotten held up, or to find out why she had left him if they had just somehow missed each other. And maybe he didn't keep her waiting that long, but she had left. All the things you would expect someone to do if you had a plan to meet them, that you would try to get in contact with each other to let them know, I'm not going to show up, or I've left, or whatever the reason. None of these things happened. Perhaps he would have called her later that night, but we can only speculate. All we know is that based on his story, we know based on their phone records that no one tries to communicate with, neither of them try to communicate with each other. Between 5 and 5.30, track practice ends. Now, practice is usually over by 5.30, though it often ends earlier. And given the approaching weather, it wouldn't be surprising if that day track practice ends earlier. That would also be consistent with that 458 phone call we talked about earlier being the call from Adnan to Jay for him to pick up Adnan. Five o'clock would be on the early side of practice ending. But again, bad weather's coming. It's Ramadan. A lot of kids not running. Practice may very well be ending early. 5.14 p.m., there's an incoming call that likely goes to voicemail. It lasts a minute and seven seconds. And there doesn't appear to be any location data for this call. So between 5.15 and 6 o'clock, Christy Vinson, who's called Kathy back when we were using pseudonyms, who is Jen's sorority sister, a, a friend of Stephanie, and a casual friend of Jay's, says that Jay and Adnan come to her home. It's probably closer to 6, as Judge Judy was on at the time, and Christy remembers it. At 5.38, there is a two-second call to Krista, not Christy, Krista, who is one of the, the, the people from Woodlawn. This call pings a tower at 501 North Athol Avenue in the C Quadrant. This quadrant covers the I-70 park and ride, where Jay will say that he and Adnan left Hayes' body in the back of her car earlier. It is also in the general direction of Christy Vinson's home. According to Jay's second statement, at around 5.45, track practice ends and Jay comes back to get Adnan. He says in that second statement that they go to two friends' houses and smoke some more pot. He says while they're at, their, at that house, Adnan receives two phone calls, one from Hay's family and the other from the police. He says he doesn't know where Hay is. Afterwards, he tells Jay that they have to get rid of the body because the police are already looking for him. This is what Jay says happens in that second statement. At 6 p.m., Don, who has been at work at the Lens Crafters, gets off work. At around the same time, Adnan calls Lens Crafters to see if Hay ever showed up. But even if Don would normally have been there when this call came in, he's not at the right location. He's working at a different Lens Crafters location that day, so he doesn't find out at that point that Hay is missing. And really quick, it's not Adnan that calls Lens Crafters. It's the officer that calls. Right. Sorry. Lens crafters. Adcock, not Adnan. <laughs> I'm only pointing that out so people don't get confused that Adnan's not trying to figure out what's happening to Hay at this point. It's still the officer making calls to all the usual suspects, ex-boyfriend, current boyfriend, friend at school, right? Now, at 6.07 p.m., young Lee calls Adnan, and this call lasts 56 seconds. This call is pinging off the tower and quadrant that covers Christy Vincent's house. Adnan will later say that he was in the car with Jay when he heard this call. He was driving and he remembered reaching across Jay to get the phone out of the glove compartment where he kept it. And I think one thing that's important to note here, there's this is another thing there's no contention about. Adnan says he was with Jay at this point. So Adnan says he was at the school during the murdering hay period. 
but he was with Jay earlier that day, and he's with Jay at this point. And this is what Adnan says he remembers. He says, I wasn't at Christie's. I was in the car with Jay. He was sitting right next to me. He reached across from him and got the phone. It's a very visceral memory he has. And the detail makes you almost feel like he might be telling the truth. But either way, he's with Jay when this call happens. And again, very interesting. Seemingly not close to this guy, but he's with him at two separate times because there's track practice in between of seeing someone he supposedly is not that close with. At 6.09 p.m., Adnan receives a call from an unknown person, and this call lasts 53 seconds. It pings a different UMBC tower, but one that also covers Christie's house. It's believed by many that this is a call from Aisha to tell Adnan that Hay is missing and the police will call him. Now, this would explain Christie's statement to police that Adnan got a call from a friend and started freaking out about it, asking what he should do and what he should say. And what's interesting about this is we said these calls are sort of incoming now. And and once again, Adnan is consistent that he's with Jay. These incoming calls are pinging these towers that are around Christie's house. There's going to be some controversy about whether they were at Christie's house or not, but the phone certainly seems to be pinging towers around there. Maybe this is the incoming call thing messing things up, but it does happen to be consistent so far, at least, with what Jay is telling police. At 624. At 624 p.m., Officer Adcock calls Adnan. Now, this call lasts four minutes and 15 seconds. Adcock will note in his report and testify at trial that Adnan told him he had not seen Hay after school. She was supposed to give him a ride, but he'd been late, and by the time he arrived, she'd already left. And that's what Adcock remembers Adnan telling him. Adnan and Hay's friend Becky would tell police that she recalled a discussion between Adnan and Hay in which Hay told Adnan she could not take him that day and he'd need to find a ride from someone else. She did not testify to this at trial. And by the time of the podcast serial, she didn't remember it at all. Interestingly, Adnan did not tell that to Officer Adcock. He'd later deny to another officer that he asked Hay for a ride at all, so his story changes. Ordinarily, Adnan wouldn't need a ride. Remember, he had his own car. And given that his alibi is hanging out at the school until track practice, asking Hay for a ride would be suspicious. And there's already problems, as we're seeing, in whether he had anything to do with this or not. The, the use of the car, being there at track practice, not calling hey, when he's running late, changing his story about whether he needed a ride or not, is already creating problems right here. There's a couple things that are interesting about this. The reason Adcock has Adnan's number is because Young Lee has already called Adnan. You might be wondering, how'd Young Lee have his number? Well, the reason is because Young Lee, as evidenced by Hay's diary, where she tells him to stop reading her diary, knows about Hay's diary. So when he finds out she's missing, he goes and he gets the diary. He opens up the diary to the page that has Don's name written all over it. He sees a phone number. He assumes that's Don. So when he calls that number, he's not calling Adnan. He's calling Don. But Adnan answers the phone. Now, he recognizes Adnan's voice because he knows about Adnan. And so he asks him the questions, and he gives that number to Officer Adcock so he can call it. Then Adcock calls. In Serial, there are things about Serial that I just don't understand. And one of them is this moment where Sarah Koenig is like, is this a red flag? Is it not a red flag? I don't know. This is obviously a red flag. It is obviously a red flag that Adnan is saying to Officer Adcock, I asked Hay for a ride, confirming what Krista is going to say and other people are going to say, that that Adnan asked Hay for a ride. And then later on, Adnan tells an officer, I didn't ask him for a ride. What are you talking about? That is a huge red flag. Now, maybe Adnan realizes by the time the second officer talks to him, which is before Hay's body is found, by the way, that if anything's happened to Hay, he's going to be a suspect, and so he's changing his story. But he's absolutely changing his story, and in a critical way. If Adnan asked Hay for a ride that day, the day that she died, the day that she disappeared, that's a big problem for him. That is a huge red flag, giant, waving red flag. So I don't really understand what Sarah Canning was talking about there. It clearly is a red flag, whatever it means. But she does it in such a, like a yoga Zen-esque way. Like, is it a big deal? Is it not? I was like, Sarah, you ain't never been in a courtroom, I can tell. <laughs> because counsel would be jumping up and down, pointing out that this is a red flag. And they do. This is crazy because you want to distance yourself, obviously, from the, the 
girl who was murdered. He would have been like the most unlucky guy to have been the one to request a ride and then be the last person to potentially be with her before she's murdered. Not great. So you understand why he would change his story after the fact. Now, when Adcock calls Adnan, Adnan is actually the one who suggests that police should check in with Hay's new boyfriend, Don. It's great to point fingers at other people if you are freaked out about being looked at by the police. Now, this call also pings the same tower as the last call, suggesting that he's probably in the same place. Guys, it is time to get big mad over true crime. If you like this show and you like true crime cases, there is no one better than Heather Ashley. It's a single host podcast, so you don't have to listen to a whole lot of small talk like you do with me and Alice. All cases are done by listener request, and no case is too small. Heather gets down to the facts in a straightforward way, and she is absolutely hilarious and i gotta tell you she has one of the best research podcasts out there brett i don't think it's an overstatement to say that heather ashley is one of my favorite people not to mention favorite podcasters and big mad true crime is something you guys will absolutely love her storytelling is bar none it's like you're talking with your best friend and she says what we're all thinking but maybe afraid to say out loud Heather's afraid of nothing. She will say it with passion and compassion for the victims. And that's huge, Brett. I know we talk a lot about victims, but boy, does Big Mad True Crime have respect for the victims. They have huge heart and zero time for BS, which is a direct quote from one of her listeners. And we are all here for her Heatherisms and her sassy one-liners. I can repeat them all day long. And when I repeat them in my real life, people think I'm way cooler than I actually am. And the length of her podcast is perfect for a commute, although I'd listen to her talk all day long. And she has just one case per episode usually, but she's done multi-parters. So if you are tired of people doing 14 part cases like we do, you will love Big Mad True Crime's succinct way of getting through cases in an episode. So you need to listen to Big Mad True Crime. It is available anywhere you listen to podcasts and she is dropping new episodes every Monday. Check it out. You won't regret it. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to us talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month saving of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Guys, I want you to ask yourself, how much time do you spend on yourself in a given week versus how much time do you spend on other people? And how do you balance the two? It's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. And that's where better help can come in. When we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Absolutely, Brett. You know, we are all so busy. We balance our jobs. We balance friends and relationships and also all our responsibilities at home and work. And sometimes it can feel like a lot. And all it takes is being able to reach out and get therapy, even when you think you're too busy. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash prosecutors. 
Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do where it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving Moving, installations, or cleaning, Angie is there for you, and they're there for you with confidence. So, Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or, they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that download the free angie mobile app today or visit angie.com that's a-n-g-i.com check them out today angie.com a-n-g-i.com and once again i'll just note this is an incoming call so this is one of those calls people question the accuracy of there's consistency here. I think we've now had three or four incoming calls. All of them are pinging over Christie's apartment. And Christie's later going to say the reason for that is because Adnan was high as a kite when he showed up. And he's sitting over there, like next to her bed, acting weird and getting all these phone calls at the time. People are going to question that and they're going to question this location data. But it certainly is consistent, both with what Jay said and with what Krista said. So let's go back to some of Jay's statements and the things he says. He says that around 645, and this is in his first statement, that Adnan calls Jay on Adnan's cell phone to tell him to pick him up at the school. Obviously, this time is incorrect, but this is the time that he's giving in this first statement. The first statement is all over the place. He says they go to get something to eat, and he says that while they're eating, Adnan's basically breaking his fast, Jay says a police officer calls him while they're eating and informs Adnan about what's happened, that Hay is missing. And at this point, Adnan tells Jay that they already know Hay is missing because she didn't pick up her cousin like she was supposed to. And at this point, they drive to Jay's house for a shovel and a pick and drive back to the park and ride where they dropped off the car. They then take the car to Leakin Park. They dig a hole. They bury Hay. And by the time they're burying her, Jay says it's dark. It's been dark for a couple hours. This is his first statement. Timing's off, which is not surprising. So is the location. There are two explanations for this, possible explanations. First is Jay's just lying. He's making it up. And that's not what happened. And you can tell it's not what happened by the cell phone pings. And they clearly were at Christie's house. I think what Jay will say in his explanation about why the second one changes is he's trying to keep people that he knows out of this. So the reason he lies about this is he doesn't want to say we were at Christie's house when this happened because he doesn't want to implicate Christie in this story. Given that Christie remembers this as well, it's probably more likely that the two of them were there, regardless of what happened, whether Adnan's guilty or not, that they were there when Adnan gets these calls. Now, Jennifer Pusateri, her statements are going to be important as well. And she says that around 645, something different is going on. So her recollection of what's happening right after Officer Adcock calls Adnan is that Jay will page Jennifer. Now, at first, I kept hearing about pagers, and I thought this was just like the 1999 term for text messages. I never had a pager, personally. When I was growing up, you, either doctors or drug dealers, only people had pagers. Apparently, that wasn't true, but that was like our conceit. Well, they did have pagers back then, and she had a page, and this was a page that Jay had left her to let her know where to pick him up. Now, this wasn't a pager where it's like written out. This was actually a voice message pager. So Jay is actually leaving a voicemail with her. Jennifer says that when she gets the call, the message is confusing. She doesn't really understand what Jay is saying. So she actually calls him back on his phone. Weirdly, she says, Adnan answers and says that Jay will call her. Now we're going to see in a second when we get to these phone calls in the timeline, the cell phone records confirm that there is a page to Jennifer at 7 p.m. And there is an incoming call to the cell phone nine minutes later 
possibly from Jennifer, that lasts 33 seconds. A cell phone expert will later testify that this call pinged a tower near Leakin Park. Another call comes in at 716 and lasts 32 seconds. It pings the same tower. Not only is this tower essentially in Leakin Park, it also is less than a mile from the park and ride where Jay says Adnan stashed the car. That's Jen's story, and they're pretty consistent in that this whole notion that at some point Jay is giving this message to Jennifer to pick him up. Jennifer doesn't really know what he's talking about, and she is calling him back. At 6.59, the cell phone calls Yasser Ali, one of Adnan's friends. This call lasts about 27 seconds. By this call, the phone has moved a good bit north up to the Woodlawn Tower that covers Woodlawn High School. As you may recall, all of the previous calls have been happening in and around this girl named Christie's house, which is down by University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she goes to school. And she will later tell the police that Adnan and Jay showed up at her house. Hi, kind of hung out for a while, took some phone calls, and then left. By this point, they have clearly left that area. Whether they were there, whether they were ever there or not, they're not there anymore. The phone has now moved up a good bit north, up towards Woodlawn High School, which also brings it back towards a lot of the areas that we care about. Things like the Park and Ride, which is the place that Adnan and Jay supposedly left Hay's car with Hay in the trunk of the car. It's also up near Leakin Park, and it's up near where Hay's car will eventually be found. It's 7 o'clock, so just after this call, there's another call to Jen's pager. This call is pinging that same tower up near Woodlawn, Woodlawn High School. So it's pretty clear that by about 7 o'clock, the car and the cell phone, and presumably Jay and Adnan, are now back up near Woodlawn High School. At 7 o'clock, or around 7 o'clock, Don gets home from work. He was working at the Lens Crafters. Remember, not the Lens Crafters that he normally works at, but a different Lens Crafters. He lives about an hour away from his home, so it took him about an hour to get back from the Lens Crafters when he left around 6. Sometimes after this, he will actually get a call from the lab manager at the Lens Crafters where he and Hay work, asking him if he has any idea where Hay was. She didn't show up for work that day, obviously, and people are starting to get worried. So in other words, everyone is calling around. The word has gotten around it. Everyone's kind of trying to figure out where Hay is. And this is the first time a lot of people, most people, even know that Hay was missing other than her family. And so now, I mean, truly, this is one of the faster acting situations because this is only seven o'clock. And we know at about 3.20, 3.30 really is when anyone knows something is amiss because remember she missed picking up her cousin at 320 and so we're talking about in a matter of four hours everyone is being notified because the police are trying to find hey that she is that something has happened to her so it's 709 and 716 they're going to be two calls which are incredibly important these are both incoming calls and they both ping off of a tower at 2121 Windsor Garden Lane, Sector B of this tower. This area, this sector of this tower covers two really important locations. The first is the park and ride where Jay will later tell police that Hayes' car was left by Adnan with her body in the back while they did the things they did that afternoon. And the other area is Leakin Park, where Hayes' body will be found buried in a shallow grave. The 709 call is likely from Jen, who would later tell police that she received a page from Jay that she did not really understand, and she called him back. Remember, we know for a fact that at 7 o'clock, there's a call to Jen's pager. So that is consistent with what Jen is saying. At 7 o'clock, there's a call to her pager. This is still pinging that Woodlawn Tower up near the high school. Then by the time she calls back, the cell phone, if you think the incoming call location data is accurate, has moved a little bit south and a little bit east into Leakin Park and Environs. Leakin Park, if you listen to Serial, it's presented to you at first as if nobody even knows where that is. I mean, that's nowhere near Woodlawn High School. But as Sarah Koenig will tell you, it is right there. It's not far from Woodlawn High School 
at all. And so by this point, by 709, the pinging from the cell phone at least has now moved into that area. This call is likely from Jen, and she said shortly after receiving that page, she called Jay because she was totally confused. She did not understand what he was saying in this page. Recall, Jen has a pager that's a voice pager. So it's not the kind you type out. She's actually hearing the message that's being left. So she calls this number. It's unknown who the 716 call is from. It lasts about 32 seconds. Jay will later testify that during this call, Adnan was speaking Arabic. So who knows who that's from, but that's what Jay says. And once again, both those calls, both the 709 call and the 716 call are pinging that tower that covers Leakin Park. An interesting fact, and we will come back to this later, the cell phone never pings that tower again except for one time. And we'll probably talk about that that other time that the cell phone pings that tower in the next episode. So moving on in the timeline, at 8.04 and 8.05, there are calls to Jennifer's pager again, and they are consistent with her statement to police and her trial testimony. These calls ping the tower at 501 North Athol Avenue. The first one is in the A sector of that cell phone tower, and the second one is at the C sector. The A sector, if you remember, covers the area where Hayes' car would be left and later found. And the C sector is to the west, heading away from the area and back towards the wood lawn area. According to Jay and Jennifer's first statement, Jay calls or pages Jennifer and asks her to pick him up at the Westview Mall. Jay and Adnan have just dropped off Hay's car at the time, and Jennifer heads to the mall where she finds Jay with Adnan. Jay gets in Jennifer's car, and she will later tell the police that it's at this point that Jay tells her that Adnan killed Hay. And one thing to remember about these calls, these are both outgoing calls. And there's controversy about these these calls, as we've said several times, but not really about the outgoing calls. So the outgoing calls are, are pretty much considered to be accurate. And it is very interesting, sort of the movement of the cell phone, because that first call where the car is dropped off, then the cell phone appears to be moving now away from where the car has been dropped off in the direction of where Jennifer will say and will testify at trial that she picked up Jay, who was with Adnan at the time. And according to Jay's second statement, Adnan drops him off at his house and Jennifer picks him up there. Now, Jennifer actually sticks to her story at trial that this all happened at the mall. And like Brett just said, based on the cell phone pings, the outgoing call and the accuracy of that location with Jennifer, who does not have the same credibility issues as Jay does, it seems more likely this probably happened in the mall area. Now, after visiting Jay's girlfriend, Stephanie's house, and dropping off her birthday present, remember this whole day was her birthday, and kind of the reason that Adnan says he's with Jay is to get Stephanie a present, Jennifer and Jay drive back to Westview Mall. Jay has told Stephanie that Adnan used Jay's shovels to bury hay and that they are in a dumpster behind the stores. Apparently deciding that he may have left fingerprints on these shovels, Jay walks back to the dumpster while Jennifer stands guard for him. Afterwards, they go to a birthday party on the University of Maryland's campus, and then they go to a friend's house named Christy Vinson. And this is the same Christy that Adnan and Jay had visited earlier. So Jay and and Jennifer go back. They go back to Christy's house. And Christy basically says that Jay and Jennifer, they showed up at her house, they act weird the whole time, and then they just kind of leave. So it's kind of funny. And we're going to talk in more depth about Christy's, how she remembers this day happening and some possible contradictions to that. But her story is funny because she's basically like, I was just at my house and Jay showed up once with this weird high guy and they acted really weird the whole time and then just left. And then a few hours later, Jay shows up with Jennifer and they act really weird the whole time and then just leave. So Christy had sort of a weird day that day to the extent that, that is the day when all this happened. And we'll get into that later. 
And, you know, we mention a lot of these things because some of you are hearing this case for the first time and you're coming into it fresh and you don't have any preconceived notions. Others of you know everything about this case. And so you know the contradictions. And look, we can't talk about everything as we're going through the timeline. So we are going to hit all these points later on. So if you're screaming at the radio right now, but what about Judge Judy? <laughs> then we're going to get into that later on. Don't worry. But this is sort of the general story that you hear with the timeline. So by 901, Adnan calls Nisha again. Remember, Adnan had actually called Nisha earlier in the day with Jay and had put Jay on the phone. Well, now he's calling her back. At this point, the cell phone is now pinging the tower that covers his home, the mosque, and other areas. So at this point, Jay and Adnan have definitely separated, and now Adnan has his phone and his car back and basically whatever had happened if the two of them were involved in this together it is now ended for the night at 903 and 907 adnan calls krista krista remember is the friend that adnan saw earlier in the day the one that he told hey was going to give him a ride and then overheard him asking hey for a ride they talk on the phone for six and eight minutes and it's during this call that krista tells adnan that hey is missing Adnan, of course, already knows this from the call with young Lee and Officer Adcock earlier. Adnan is apparently driving in his car during this conversation, but it is pinging the same tower as before. By 10 o'clock, Jay is now doing what Alice mentioned earlier. He's swinging by Stephanie's house to tell her happy birthday and to give her her present. And then at 10.15, and really between 10.15 and 11.30, is when Jay and Jen go over to Christy Vincent's house. They stay for 45 minutes, act weird the whole time, and then eventually they leave. And that is the end of January 13th, which is the most important day in this entire case, and the day where whatever happened, happened. And as far as the cell phone records go, Jay's story, Jen's story, that's the end of the day. The next day will be active as well. And then we're going to sort of go through all the things that happen in the days and weeks that follow this as people learn that Hay is missing and they learn that eventually that she's been murdered and buried in Leakin Park. But that will be a story for next time. So one thing to remind you all of, I know there have been a lot of cell phone calls and it's hard to keep track of all of them. And it sounds like this is a lot of distance. As we mentioned at the top of this episode, this whole kind of area, the A, B, C sectors are really covering about what, three miles radius. And so we're not talking about a very large distance. And this is important because cell phone towers cover different amounts of areas based on density of population. And so when you have a very dense area, this makes sense, right? A cell phone tower will cover a smaller radius because it has to service more cell phone pings. And if you're in a more rural area, you could have a cell phone tower that reaches 10, 15, maybe even 20 miles, which is a much larger area. So the fact that this radius of this particular cell phone tower is relatively succinct actually gives us a better idea of where the cell phone is traveling because each mile changes where in the sector it's pinging within this tower. And that's really valuable here. So something to keep in mind when we talk about how accurate it is and you know incoming versus outgoing, but also remember that this particular tower is in a more densely populated area, meaning we have a more precise read on where the pings are within a matter of a couple miles. It's not it's not an exact science, but it's going to be a lot more precise than if we were in rural Maryland, for example. And we're going to talk a lot more about what Jay says happened, what Jen says happened. We're going to talk more about these cell phone pings, about how accurate they are and how accurate they aren't. People argue about them a lot, but and I've said this a couple times during the episode, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I think it's worth remembering. There's a lot of controversy about the incoming calls, and that's because of some documentation that came from AT&T when these records were turned over for use at trial. But there's a lot of outgoing calls here too. And those outgoing calls are not as controversial. And they also show a pattern. And there's a lot of things that just aren't disputed. And one of those is that for much of the day, Jay and Adnan are together with the cell phone and with Adnan's car. And so it tells you something. Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, the cell phone records are useless. They don't mean anything. Well, that's obviously not true. And we try not to take extreme views on anything here, and we're not going to do it with these records either. But 
Don't worry, we're going to talk a lot more about these as we move on. Wallace, I, you know, I think we've probably said enough for this episode, but one thing we promised people in the last episode is that we would answer a question. We have said, and all of you know, if you leave a five-star review on Apple and you include a question, we will answer that question during an episode. So I have, I have a question, let's see, that I'm going to ask. And Alice, I feel like it's always unfair because I've seen the questions before you do. And then I ask you. The I know it's, it really is sort of... to like putting me on the spot. This is like <clears throat> the ultimate, you know, for for piano players, it's sight reading is the test. This is like a lawyer's sight reading of a question. What's the answer? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want me to answer the question first, I'll answer the. Question I might have first. you do, but that. I'll ask the question, <laughs> and then you can decide whether you need a moment to think about. <sighs> it. And the question is, and I think this is a great question: If you could have been the prosecutor in any historical case. What case would you have liked to have prosecuted? Jeez. There's so many factors to consider there. Obviously, you've thought about this, so you can go first. I have thought about this, though I will say there was one that popped into my mind basically immediately. So I have thought about it a lot, but, you know, I don't want everybody to think that this was, that I overthought this. So I think one of the most fascinating prosecutions of all time was the... Adolf Eichmann prosecution in Israel. So Adolf Eichmann, for those of you who don't know, was the architect of the Holocaust. And at the conclusion of World War II, he, through the Odessa Project, which was a way that the Nazis got people out of Europe to South America, fled from Nazi Germany, which was falling at the time, to Argentina. And then eventually the nation of Israel, which was founded shortly after World War II, they sent their intelligence agency, the Mossad, to Argentina where they found him, they drugged him, and they smuggled him out of the country and took him back to Israel and made him stand trial for his role in the Holocaust. And what was interesting about it, and if you've ever had an opportunity to watch any documentaries on it, they're fascinating. What was interesting about it was the Nuremberg trials, which were great, were... Not really, I mean, they were about the Holocaust and that was a part of it, but they were really about sort of making offensive war. And there were no victims of the Holocaust who testified. It was done entirely through documentation and pictures and testimony by military members and everything else. The Eichmann trial was the first opportunity for people who had been victims of the Holocaust to testify about what had happened to them and what Eichmann and his henchmen had done and to sort of bear witness for the world on what had happened. And they talked about the prosecution and how they did this and that this was so important to them to do it just the right way so that the voices of these victims could be heard. And there's this one fascinating moment in the trial where they have a witness on the stand and the witness is talking about how he was in the Warsaw ghetto and he saw a boy, a young boy who gets, there's a, a Gestapo agent and he is beating this boy almost to death and almost kills him, and really just does it on a whim. I mean, he could have killed him if he'd wanted to. He, he could have just done it. And this guy who's testifying talks about how he like runs up to the kid, to the boy, and sort of drags him out of the street and, and is able to nurse him back to health. And the prosecutor says, do you see that boy in the courtroom today? And the witness says, yes. And he says, will you point him out? And he points to the assistant prosecutor. And the assistant prosecutor was the boy who had survived the war, grown up, fled to Israel, become a lawyer, become a prosecutor, and is now prosecuting Adolf Eichmann in this trial. And like, I mean, there's nothing, nothing really compares to that. So for me, if I could be involved in any prosecution, I think, I think that one is the one I would pick. That was really intense. How do you top something like that? And I don't think you can actually well, top I, that. I said you could have gone first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, that's absolutely fascinating. And this goes outside the realm of like regular true crime. But I agree with you. So one, one summer, I had the opportunity to go with a professor to Eritrea, which had gone through, you know, many, many years of war with Ethiopia. And they, you know, hadn't implemented really any civil protections for the last 25 ever. They tried to start implementing them in the last 25 years. And part of all these wars, unfortunately, where there were a lot of war crimes and a lot of crimes against humanity, those sorts of things, but they had no way, no independent judiciary to process these devastating crimes, you know, rape, murder, 
everything, women, children, innocent, bystanders, civilians, you name it. And it was happening both, of course, on the Eritrean side and the Ethiopian side. And so I got to watch my professor basically set up an adjudicatory body to prosecute these types of crimes that were otherwise going to go completely unvindicated and watching watching someone set up an independent judiciary to prosecute war crimes and crimes against humanity was one of the like most incredible experiences I've ever had a kind of a backseat and help with like the research you know I didn't I didn't have a law degree at that point really law was of no matter because nobody really had law degrees who were working on this and to see that type of work, I mean, there are very few places where you can prosecute, you know, war crimes. There are basically a handful of nonprofits that go around and help nations set up these adjudicatory bodies. And then there's like the Department of Justice that does this type of work, but it's incredibly difficult work. It's incredibly tiring. You don't get a lot of vindication, especially in a lot of these countries where rule of law is but a mere fiction. But I can kind of also think of nothing more worthy to do with your time if you had the ability to basically go and live in a place that is very difficult to live in order to do what the law is meant to do, to have rule of law, to be able to uphold you know, the basic rights of every human being that exists absent of whether it's written down on any paper. It exists because we're all humans with dignity that is God-given and not man-given. Yeah, and, and we've both had the pleasure to know people who, who did that in Iraq after the war and, and to help set up court systems, you know, in, in a very difficult situation. And I, yeah, I think those things are fascinating. So that's awesome, Alice, that you had the opportunity to do that. Mine's more sort of like I would have liked to have done it. You've actually done it. So that's pretty <laughs> I, I did not do it. I got but. to take a backseat to others <laughs> who were doing it, which was absolutely fascinating. So anyways, those are really good questions. And there's more to be said there. But if you were able to prosecute that case, I mean, you would have been brilliant. That's for sure. I think there are like some cases that are just too, too close to home because my my family has been like victim to to very similar types of crimes against humanity i don't know that i would be able to like keep my cool but you're the type of prosecutor i would want to go after those people <laughs> well that was you know another thing that was fascinating about this is so many of the people involved were you know actual victims so that was and and they talked about that in a lot of the documentaries they talk about how how difficult it was and how one of the prosecutors talks about the first time he ever he ever met Eichmann and how he had just finished reading a, you know, a dossier where Eichmann is ordering like 100,000 people to be murdered. And then there's a knock on the door and, and Adolf Eichmann has come to see him for the first time for their first like interview. And he's like, I had to put the dossier down and I had to put aside my visceral hatred for this man and do my job and do it according to the rules and according to law. And yeah, I mean, just fascinating stuff. And if, if you guys have not had an opportunity to look into that piece of history, it, it is really incredible. And that's so beautifully said because that is the very basis of rule of law, right? The rule of law is it treats everyone the same because if you don't have that rule of law, if you're like, well, it doesn't apply to Nazis, very quickly you fall into utter chaos. And we've had this probably legal briefs on this before, but that is the ultimate test, right? The Nazis. And to be able to put aside one's own feelings, to be able to recognize that, to have those structures in place to protect even these horrendous humans with their rights is exactly what rule of law means. And that's why we've, you know, talked many times about when we've kind of rejected the idea of just tear it all down, just build something else. Who decides what to build up? When those protections can be ripped down willy nilly, no matter, depending on who's on the other side of the V, is a really scary world to live in and not one that I'd like to venture into. And so that was, that's beautifully said and an incredibly important point that I hope everyone takes away from that. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because the Nuremberg trials, the Soviets were one of the judges. It was basically the four powers acted as judges. And the Soviets were like, why are we doing this trial again? Why are we just shooting all these people? You know, because <laughs> that was their approach to things. It was just like, why are we having a trial? And the British and the French and the Americans were like, no, we're going to have a trial. And the Soviets basically just voted to execute everybody. <laughs> and, then the, and the British and the Americans and the French were, were kind of arguing about do people get executed? Do they go away for life? Do they get 20 years? And, and that's a entirely, I mean, you could talk about that for, you could have a whole podcast on the Nuremberg trials, which would be pretty interesting. But 
yeah, so hey, keep sending us these questions. They're great questions. They lead to great discussions. I love talking to Alice about this kind of stuff, and I love sharing this stuff with you guys. So please do send us anything you got. We are happy to talk about it. But remember, the best way to do it, leave a five-star review and leave a question, and we will answer it. Well, Alice, do you have anything else to add either about what we talked about with Adnan Syed or anything with these other st- subjects before we sign off for today. You know, it would just be like us to, in one breath, talk about Adnan and cell phone pings and the next talk about Nuremberg trials. <laughs> I like to think we're well, we're well <laughs> I, I, versed. I, I, we're, I'm only we're... saying it for the people who feel like they've been on an emotional and intellectual whiplash. We're right there with you. Welcome to our life. <laughs> 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 no, Brett, except that it's always a joy getting to talk to you. And I love hearing about you always surprise me in the best way i feel like i know you and then you you know pull out some beautiful answer like that and make me want to cry and it might be hormones but it also might be because you're a beautiful human being you're a beautiful human being (laughs) i like your use of beautiful let's see how many times we can say beautiful (laughs) so beautiful all right well we're gonna sign off for today know you guys got questions thoughts and comments prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod on twitter Instagram, Facebook, all that jazz. Join the discussion on the gallery, which is our Facebook page. It is always amazing. And hello to all of you listening early and ad-free on Patreon and to those of you who have joined us for this live recording today. We will be back next week with more timeline. We're going to finish up the timeline. Cross your fingers next week so we can sort of dive into the nitty-gritty of this case. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. <laughs> and doesn't even begin to then. <laughs> You guys, okay, I just have to let the people in this room know really quick. So I I like in the last like 30 seconds, I was like running with all my podcast equipment, like running like this down the hall because I finally got Brittany, you know, quiet and almost asleep. And like I'm running down the hall and I was like, I got to park this somewhere. (laughs) And so I ran into this room, but it's like kind of a big room as you can see. And so I have this blanket that it looks like trash. This looks like my kids built a fort. Do we need to stop? Do you hear that? <laughs> I, I do. I do hear that. You know what? Unfortunately, I think she hears my voice now. I'm going to have to find a new closet to record in. <laughs> 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 Don't worry, guys. There's a lot of closets in this house. I'm going to have to find another closet. <laughs> It's not Don. Come on. They've been dating for two weeks. Give me a break.
<laughs> the Dawn thing is so weird. Like, I can't... It is, like... I'm sorry. I, I, I find the Dawn thing to be just incredibly unethical. Like, the idea that this poor guy who had known Hay for a couple months, who had dated her for less than two weeks, for the remainder of his life, has been slandered, harassed, bothered over this wackadoodle theory that somehow he decided to kill her that day and everybody at the lens crafter conspired to do it and his mom and his stepmom or afterwards but actually they're having to do it beforehand changing the time to make it look like he's at work when he's really murdering her it's like come on i mean that's another one it's like just because you think adnan didn't do it does not give you permission to ruin someone else's life to try and cast doubt on the fact that he did it and that's what people do to don i think the don thing's terrible i think it's really like awful I think it's awful what people do to Don. His mom and stepmom could not have changed the cards. Let's just go ahead and lay that out for all time. They could not have changed the cards. The only way Don's cards could have been changed is if beforehand, like as he's doing it, people conspired with him to fake his time card. That is a fact. Fact. There is no changing of Don's time cards afterwards. It did not happen and people need to stop saying it because it did not happen period and let me just say i'm not blaming anybody on here for thinking it might have been don because you've been lied to for years for years you have been lied to by people who should know better that is not don it is not don i mean that's one of the things that drives me crazy about this case i don't know who did this i don't care who did it but what i know for certain is it wasn't don and this poor guy for years for years has been targeted by people who should know better, attacked by people who should know better, and accused of a murder that he did not commit, that he could not commit. You talk about, al you talk about alibis, he had a rock solid alibi. You talk about motives, he had no motive. It's just, it's absurd. It's absurd and it's sad. And, and I just, you know, I'm sorry. I just think somebody needs to say it because I'm just tired of it. That's, that's one of the things, and this is, this is the thing. This is the thing that gets me. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to get on a, a, a rant here, but I just get so tired of this like ethics and true crime thing coming from people who do things like accuse an innocent guy of, of murdering somebody on the basis of nothing other than they don't want it to be the person they like. That's just terrible. I mean, it's a terrible thing to do. So, yeah, I mean, and, and look, you know, look no further than the motion to, to, invalidate Adnan's conviction and release him. There wasn't any mention of Don in there. And Don's not one of the alternative suspects because Don didn't do it. And everybody knows Don didn't do it. Everybody knows Don didn't do it, including the people who want to say Don did it solely because they don't want Adnan to have done it. And like, I'm sorry. We need to call that out. All of us do. That is, that is just, that is, that is like so bad when people do that. This is just an ordinary guy. Innocent people. He didn't ask to be a part of this. You know, he didn't inject himself into this. He dated a girl for a couple of weeks back in the 90s. And here we are in 2023 20, talking about him. <laughs> like, it blows my mind. I just, I can't believe it. It's a streaming hot summer on Pluto TV featuring hit blockbusters during popcorn summer movies. Watch Mark Wahlberg try and solve a murder in Four Brothers. Or go on an adventure with an Indiana Jones movie marathon. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies. Available live and on demand. Download Pluto.